Okay. This is a sikha a shir on Likuti Sikha's book 23, Chelik Chav Gimel, the sikha of Kairach, the third sikha. It's a sikha uh, a Rashi, deals with the Rashi, and we'll see very fascinatingly how the Rebbe um, teaches us that sometimes oh, we have to learn the words of Rashi as a flow in the Pasuk. Different than we've uh, th anything I think we've studied together before. Okay, in this week's parsha, so the beginning of the parsha is all about Kairach, about the argument of Kairach, about the uh, the earth opening up, swallowing the people, a lot of a lot of action. But really, a major part of the portion of Kairach is the challenge that was placed to the Kohuna of Aaron, the priesthood, the high priesthood, particularly of Aaron, the high priest. Korach said that. Um, Moshe took the position of king. He gave his brother, his older brother, the position of high priest of Kohen Gadol. And so there was a challenge to the priesthood of Aaron. And therefore, towards the end of the parsha, Hashem gives us the, spells out the matnot kuhuna, all the gifts that were given to the Kohenim. One of them being the law of Bechor Shoir, firstborn bull, a Bukhar Kesav, the firstborn from the lamb family, from the sheep family, a Bukhar Ez, or the firstborn from the goat family. So the din is that lo tifteh kodeshem, that they can't be redeemed. You can't give money for the firstborn animal and take it home to be used for, um, you know, just a personal use. Rather, kodeshem, they become holy. They themselves, and that was the firstborn animal, Needs to be brought up as a sacrifice. As Domam Tizraik, you offer up their blood. Bet Chelbam Takdir, and you offer up, you sprinkle the blood and you offer up the fats on the Mizbeach. Uvisaram, and the rest of the flesh, the meat, ye Allah, will be for you. For who? We're talking to the Kohanim. Will be for the Kohanim as a gift. And then the Pasuk makes a comparison. It will be to the Kohanim like Chazeyat Nufa, like the breast that was waved. And like the right thigh, it will be, be to you. So Rashi explains to the five-year-old who's reading the verse, what do you mean that the flesh of the animal, remember, a carbon, there's several kinds of sacrifices. There is a carbon oila, a burnt offering, which means everything goes to Hashem. But then there are other kinds of offerings where a portion goes to Hashem, another portion goes either to the Koyanim or to the owners that brought them. So here the Pasuk said that the flesh, besides for the things that need to be offered up on the altar, the blood, the fats, the rest of the flesh of the firstborn animal will go to you, to the Koyanim. At what, in what criteria will it have? It'll be treated like the, 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 the right hand thigh and the breast that is waved. What does that mean? So Rashi says that that means shel shalomim, the carbon that the, the the breast that's waved on the right hand thigh of the peace offering. What's the law of a peace offering of a shalomim? Shenecholim lakoyanim that they are eaten. The flesh, the meat is eaten. The parts that are given to the koyan in a shalomim. Shalomim is the word you may recognize. Shalom, peace. The carbon, the peace sacrifice, has a unique peacefulness to it you know when you know when there's peace when everybody gets a piece of the pie then you have peace so the shlomim you have part goes to Hashem part goes to the agents of Hashem who offered it up for you the Kohanim and parts go to the people that actually paid the money and brought the sacrifice so that's a very peaceful carbon so of that shlomim of that peace carbon the Kohanim get the chaze the, the um, breast which was Tanufa, which was waved before God. You mean W A I V I N G? That's what they. W A V E. No, W A V E D. It was. Okay. It had to be oh, Hunaf okay. Huram. It was, so okay. to speak. There was a process. Okay. There was a ritual process that uh, referred to the fact that they should be saved. I think that also has to do with bad rains and bad winds, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so it was waved. W A V E D. And it was lifted up, it was to Hashem, but that was given to the Koyanim. The rest of the flesh of the Shlomim was given to the owners, the, the Israelites. 
So the Pasuk here is saying that the entire flesh, the entire meat of the carbon, besides for the Bechar part that's offered on the Mizbeach, the rest of the meat of the firstborn animal is like, it all goes to the Kohen, like the breast and the right hand thigh within the carbon shlomim, within the peace offering that goes to the Kohen. What does it mean? It goes to the Kohen, says Rashi. Two things. Rashi says that it goes to the Kohenim, not just to the male Kohenim. It goes to their wives, their children, and their servants. <clears throat> in other words, there are some gifts to the Kohen that the Kohen must eat in a, a, a more pristine state of holiness. It's not just his financial gift. It's also, you could say, almost a ritualistic gift and only the male Koyanim can eat it. And it has to be eaten only in the actual confines of the temple. In this case, the Shlomim, the meat that goes from the peace offering to the Koyanim, it's not limited to male Koyanim. It, it's as if it becomes their financial gift. It can be eaten by anybody that's dependent on them. All of their dependents, wives, children, even servants. For how long? The Shlomim also had a more lenient, a more extended time frame of being eaten. It was able to be eaten two days and one night. So in other words, today's Thursday. If today you brought up the carbon Shlomim, you could eat it today, the whole of Thursday, Thursday night, and the entire Friday. By Friday night, it becomes Pak Tokef. It becomes um, expired. <laughs> So there are some carbonates that can only be eaten for one day and the subsequent night. And then we also say because it can be eaten only till dawn, we the Chachamim put a cutoff date, midnight. Uh, so nobody should come to mistakenly move it over to the next day. So there are, in this case, the meat of the firstborn, the Torah tells us it's like the Shlamim, the part of the carbon Shlamim that goes to the Kohenim, which means Two things, it goes to the, uh, it, the shlamim goes to their fa the, all their dependents, wives, children, and so on. And it can be eaten for two days and one night. Continues Rashi, also the bechayr, also the meat of the firstborn, is eaten for two days and one night. Now that sounds very fishy. Let's understand. Rashi said that there's two details. We're comparing the Pusik says, the verse says, that the meat of the firstborn will be for the koyanim like the Kohen meat of the Shlomim sacrifice. And then Rashi specifies what happens with the Kohen meat, with a portion of the Kohenim for the Shlomim sacrifice. Rashi specifies two things. It goes to all their dependents, wives, children, and it's eaten for two days and one night. But then Rashi sums up his pirush. He says, also the Bechar is eaten for two days and one night. One second. But what about that other point he said? There's two points in the Shlomim meat. It goes to dependence and it's eaten for two days. Rashi sums up and says, he points out those two things about the Shlomim. And then he says, when he sums up and he says, also the firstborn meat when it goes to the Kayan, and he just lists one detail, is eaten for two days. But can it be eaten by their dependence? It doesn't specify. So the Rebbe asks, like, whichever way you look at it, if Rashi is of the opinion that the meat of the firstborn indeed can only be eaten by male Kayanim, so when he brings the comparison to the Shlomim meat, why does he bring that law about the Shlomim gift to the Kohen that it's eaten by all their dependents? If it's not relevant here, if he, he thinks that the firstborn meat is only compared to the Shlomim meat, in one aspect, in the two days aspect, but not in the fact that it's eaten by the dependents. So why, when he spells out the laws of Shlomim right here, he brings also the detail that it's eaten by the dependents. So it's obvious now, you also can't say that Rashi considered it self-understood because he just said, self-understood, because he just said, Rashi just said, what the Pasuk says, the meat of the firstborn that goes to the Kohen, it's just like the meat of the Shlomim that goes to the Kohen. So if you already spelled out that the meat of the Kohen that goes to the Shlomim has two aspects. It's eaten by dependents as well. And it's also two days. So, Bechor meat 
the same. Also, those two aspects. But then why does Rashi specify half bechor that also bechor is eaten for two days? Don't specify anything. If you compare it in its entirety and you said the two details of the shlami meat, so we understand that those two details apply to bechor. <clears throat> Even greater question. The source of this Rashi is in the Sifri. Sifri is a Midrashic, Halachic <coughs> compendium, same time as Brisa and Mishnah and so on, and the Gemara. And in both of those sources, when this Pasuk is explained, it doesn't say, it just says it's like the Shlomim. It doesn't specify that by the Shlomim meat that it can be eaten by their dependents, by wives and children. It just says, the same way the shlomim is eaten for two days, also bechar meat. The kohanim can eat it for two days and one night. But Rashi does change from that source. And when he specifies the laws of the shlomim, he says that the shlomim meat that's given to the kohen is eaten by the kohen's dependents as well. So he adds it, but he doesn't seem to add it about the meat of the firstborn that goes to the kohen. So we don't know. Can the meat of the firstborn that gives to the kohen, is his wife allowed to partake of that meat or not? And by the way, halachically, it's not so simple. The footnote. Um, the footnote sends us to um, the, the, a, a bit of a discussion, a rashba and so on. <clears throat> For those of you who say every morning, the karbonis, it's fascinating that when we say habachayr, bahamaser pesach it says that it's eaten the yamim for two days and one night. It doesn't say anything about the the, the, oh, the it doesn't say if their wives can eat it or not about the bechor. Yeah. About the other shlamim, it says um, it's eaten by their wives and dependents. But the bechor doesn't specify. It's very fascinating. Well, what is Rashi's opinion here based on Rashi's commentary in the Torah? He seems to be. Uh, I don't know if it's unsure, but he, he seems to bring one detail but doesn't follow through with it. He says it's compared to the shlamim. The shlamim has two details. The shlamim meat that's given to the kohenim is eaten by the dependents, and it's two days. Also, bechayr is eaten two days. But what about one second? You left us hanging. Also, by the dependents of the kohen or not? Paragraph two. Then Rashi, in his next, he continues and he says the pasuk says this meat. Yeah, the flesh of the bechar should be for you like the wave, the woven part, the part that you wave from the shlomim and the right thigh of the shlomim. And then the Pasuk says, lechot yiyah, it will be to you. Comments Rashi, that lechot yiyah seems to be redundant. It says, um, it says, and their flesh should be for you. Ubsalam yiyah, let's read the Pasuk. The flesh of the Bechar should be for you, for the Kohen. It's going to be given, the meat of the Bechar is, after the part that's sacrificed, the meat is going to be given to the Kohen. It should be for you, like the part that you wave of the Shlomim sacrifice, it shall be to you. So that second, is a redundancy, it's miyuta. So Rashi explains, it says, Ba Rabbi Akiva v'lamit. came Rabbi Akiva and he taught, a very interesting language that I was going to ask about. Usually you would say Rabbi Akiva Omer, Ra'ama Rabbi Akiva. Here it says Rabbi Akiva came into, popped up and said, lecha kasuf The Pasik adds another lecha tihye, another yihye, it shall be. Why? It's it's hinting at something. It's saying, don't, it's trying to say yihye, it'll be for you. Like the shalami meat, not like something else. It wants to re-emphasize, not like what? Does actually not like the meat of a toida. There is a sacrifice within the shlamim family that's called korban toda, korban of thanksgiving. There's four instances where we bring a korban toda, korban of thanksgiving, and we, in our day and age, say berkat gomel, thank Hashem for bestowing upon us kindness when we are saved in a miraculous way from something dangerous. The four general things is when you go through a desert, which is a miracle to emerge unscathed, when you go through a sea, which is also miraculous, you came out unscathed, based on the sea aspect. That's why usually when we go overseas in a plane, we've crossed the sea in some way. We will say, we'll give thanks in that way. 
somebody who was in jail in danger of life, not just uh, not necessarily, or perhaps all jail is danger of life, but certainly dungeon and the old fashioned jail, certainly. And somebody who was sick in a significant way and became better. Those four people, or anybody else who had a miraculous saving from something, they would have to bring a special sacrifice to Hashem, which was called the Thanksgiving sacrifice. That was only eaten for one day and the subsequent night. So the Pasuk here says, Lecha this firstborn, the meat of the firstborn will be for you like the Shlomim meat. And it says again, it'll be for you like that, not like the Thanksgiving carbon, which has a, a smaller time limit, only a one day uh, uh, expiry date. Okay. So now that Rebbe comments on that, we have to understand, first of all, we've said many times, says Rebbe, when Rashi brings, Rashi doesn't, Rashi's not a book of, uh, a scient it's not a book of rounding up all the opinions that he should bring the name of the person who said this drasha, most of the drashas, most of the explanations Rashi brings, he doesn't attribute to the name of the person he takes it for. So why does he quote Rabbi Akiva here by name? Also, what's this very unusual language and it's longer language giving the description came along Rabbi Akiva and he said, why did he just say Rabbi Akiva said, like usually he would say. Now, let's look at the source. Where did Rabbi Akiva say this? So, Indeed, when you look at the Gemara and the Sifri, you see that the language of the Gemara is Kafatz Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva jumped up and said, "Do you know why it says that Rabbi Akiva jumped up and said? Because if you look back at the Gemara there, you'll see a very interesting description about how this halacha came up. That was a big discussion. They asked the question before the Chachamim in the vineyard in Yavne, the yeshiva in Yavne. There is, by the way, today a yeshiva, you may know, Kerem Yavne, the vineyard in Yavne. There's a a Hezdu yeshiva called Kerem Yavne. You know, they asked the question in the yeshiva in the vineyard in Yavne about what will be the law with the flesh, with the meat of the firstborn. Is it going to be equivalent to the meat of the taida, which means it can only be eaten for one day? And there's different opinions. Rabbi Akiva jumped up and said no, because Rabbi Yossi Aglili first presented a question which he, he almost seemed to be that he would be able to prove that the Shalom, that the Bechar, the, the meat of the firstborn, would be compared to the meat of the Taida. And he seemed to have presented a question that couldn't be answered. So Rabbi Akiva jumped up and said, no. I'm going to tell you that the Pasuk explicitly says, Lecha havaya The Pasuk says, no, this meat of the firstborn is going to be like the meat of the Shalom, which means a two-day expiry day. So there, in the context of back and forth, and Rabbi Yossi Aglili almost giving a knockout and saying that you have to follow my opinion, jumped up Rabbi Akiva and said, no, 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 no. But here, here it's, we don't have the context of the whole discussion. So to say, Ba Rabbi Akiva, as if we're in the middle of a story, there's no story here. The Gemara was telling a saga, so it gives you the description. Here, the, the, here's just an opinion of Rabbi Akiva, that Rashi should have just, just said, I'm Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva. Question number three, the fact that the Bechayr is eaten for two days and one night, just like Shlomim, you don't really need an additional Pasuk to say, L'chatiyah, we just said. Oh, not we just said. There's another Pasuk. There's a Pasuk later on in, in Devarim that says, Aser, uh, not a Kol HaBechor, Kol HaBechor, we read the second day Yom Tov, oh, we read the second day Kol HaBechor, every firstborn, Asher Yivaled Bibarcharcha, that's born in your flocks, you should sanctify to Hashem. Shana b'shana, it says. Year by year. Says the Gemara, what does it mean year by year? This tells us that the Bechor can be eaten in two years. Shana b'shana. The flesh, the meat of the firstborn. After you offered up the, the, the fats and the, you sprinkled the blood off the fats, the Kohen can now eat it for two days. How do we know? Because he can eat it shana b'shana in two years. If, if you're able to eat it for two days, it means technically you could eat it the last day of this year, first day of next year. So from this we derive that shana b'shana, that the Bechor meat, firstborn meat, is allowed to be eaten for two days. So we don't need this Pesach to tell us lechati to emphasize that the meat of the firstborn is not going to be like a toda, 
like a sacrifice of a Torah with a one-day expiry, but it's going to be like a shlom with a two-day expiry. We know that from an explicit verse later on that says Shana B'Shana. And Rashi, by the way, brings that verse when we get to the to the, to the the book of Devarim. So why does he use the Pasuk here? Why does he bring Rabbi Akiva's teaching here to tell us that the Bechor meat is like a shlamim, not like a Teida, where we the fact that it's eaten for two days, we know it from later on. Shana b'shana. So here's the explanation at all. Paragraph three. What Rashi, what's bothering Rashi that he wants to explain here is that there's additional language in this Pasuk that seemingly we didn't need. Because if you look at the Pasuk, it says, the flesh, the meat of the firstborn will go to the Kohen after the part to Hashem has been brought. So now, why does the Torah have to give a, a comparison and say it will be for you like what's given to the Kohen from the Shlomim sacrifice? Why do we have to give a comparison? We just said the Bechar meat goes to the Kohen. Why do we have to say just like the Shlomim meat? So Rashi says, no, this is coming to teach us some halacha about what way, what criteria there is for the Bechar meat to be eaten. So now like this. What is it trying to teach us? Why is it bringing the comparison of the Shlomim meat? If you want to say it's just telling us that we have two days to eat it like the Shlomim meat, that's why it's comparing it to the to the Shlomim meat, so it's not understood. Why does the Torah have to tell it to us by comparing it to another carbon. Why doesn't it doesn't say? Why doesn't it just say like it does by Shlomim that you're allowed to eat it for two days, right? Because, and it would be more clear if the pasuk would just tell us. If you have to say one aspect about what this meat is. You have two ways to do it. You can either say this meat you can eat for two days, or you could say this meat you can eat like the shlami meat. But now when I tell you you can eat it like the shlami meat, I have to now say, but not the, the shlami, there's two families, there's two, two kinds of carbons in the shlami family. The regular shlami that's eaten for two days, and there's the specific Thanksgiving shlami. It's also a shlami. A subset of shlami carbon is the toda, which is the Thanksgiving one. The Thanksgiving one is only eaten for one day. So now, if I want to give clarity, if Hashem wants to give clarity in the Chumash and tell you what happens with the Smid of the Bechor, how should he say it? Seemingly, the way he should say it is not to compare it to a Shlomim, where there we have to say, but which Shlomim is it compared to? Just say you can eat it for two days. Right? So that's why Rashi says it must be that when he compares it to the part of the Shlomim that goes to the Kohen, it means that it's not just one halacha. The Torah is telling us one comparison which contains two details. If we would have had to spell out the details, we would have had to spell it out in two parts. By comparing it to something else, he just had to make that comparison and it tells us that everything that applies to the shlomim now applies. Which two, which two, which two aspects? That just like the shlomim, it goes to the dependence of the Kohen as well. Wives, children, and it's eaten okay. two days. So now we'll also understand. In other words, clearly Rashi is of the opinion that the it's being uh, the um, the taida is be, the the bechor is being compared to the shlamim for both aspects. No question. Paragraph four. According to this, we'll also understand. But we had a big question. What was the big question? Rashi seems in his language, he says the he says the two aspects of the Shlamim. And when he does the recap, he says, and so also by the Bechar. So also by the Bechar, it's eaten for two days. But what about the what about the dependence? He doesn't recap and say also it's eaten by Nashayim Ubnayim Abdi. Okay, so let's leave that question pending. It's a question still. Dalin, paragraph four. So according to this, we'll also understand why Rashi learns. Why Rashi has to add, don't say it's like the part of the Toda that goes to the thing. The Torah says, Lechot Yihiyah. The post especially says, this will be for you, like the Shlomim, not like the Toda. Why doesn't Rashi just wait till the verse in Devarim, which tells us, Shana B'Shana, that the Bechor is eaten for two days. Not like the Toda. 
if we want to say that in our Pasuk it's, there's no teaching about how long the Bukhar is eaten, it would mean that the Pasuk that compares meat of the firstborn to the meat of the Shlomi, the Goskon, is just comparing it in one way, that it's eaten by the dependents. But then that would again be a question. Why does the Torah, if it's just teaching us one detail, why would the Torah teach it in a way where it where it connects it, it compares it by in a hinted in a way of hinting, compares it to the shlamim without why does it say openly, like it says about other gifts to the coin, lechan etatim, I gave them to you, belevanecha, belevnotecha, and to your children. In other words, your dependents can also eat from it. Why say it? Why don't you say it openly, explicitly, rather than saying it's like a shlomim? So Rashi learns, no, it must mean that l'cha when this Pasuk says it shall be for you, this teaches us already the halacha that it's eaten for two days, not like a toyna. So now with the words, and it should be for you like the meat of the shlomim, the Torah there cannot just be telling you the time frame to eat it. The Torah must be saying it's also eaten by the dependents. So now this Pasuk comparing it to shlomim is telling you two details. It's eaten by the, 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 the dependence of the Kayan, and it's eaten for two days. But again, why doesn't Rashi write that in the recap? We're left with that question. So the explanation for that is, paragraph five, that these two interpretations of Rashi are not two separate pirushim. You have to read them in one flow. This is a bit of a, a, a um, innovative way, revolutionary in a, in a sense way of reading the Rashi. Read the Rashi here in one flow. The Rashi starts that we learn that it's like Shlomim and Af HaBechor, full stop. Same way the Shlomim is eaten by the dependents. And it's eaten for two days. That's the law of Shlomim meat. Af HaBechor, full stop. Also, the firstborn is the same. Both aspects. Eaten by the dependents and for two days. Stop. Now Rashi says another thing. What we just said that it's eaten for two days came, so he says, L'chayiye. There's the word that says L'chayiye. Rabbi Akiva came and taught us something about L'chayiye. We shouldn't say it's like Teida. In other words, Necha, uh, um, I want to go back to the go back to the beginning if you want to the Rashi reads like this. Like the the waving of the Shlomim and the right thigh of the Shlomim, Rashi commented, the Shlomim gift of meat to the to the Kohen is eaten by the Kohen's dependents as well. And it's for two days and one night. Also the Bechar. Full stop. Now, continuing, the fact that we said, this detail that we said, that it's eaten for two days and one night, this is also taught to us by the words which Rabbi Akiva came and explained because it's not enough just to say, to leave it based, the two-day time period, leave it based on the fact that the Bechor meat is compared to the Shlomi meat. We need another drush as well. The Torah added another word to tell us, no, 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 don't make the mistake of thinking that the Bechor meat will be like the Teida Shlomim meat for one day. No, no, no. It's going to be like the regular Shlomim. So now we can understand why also the Pasuk says, Ba Rabbi Akiva, this unusual language that Rashi uses, Rabbi Akiva came along and said, he wants to make it clear that we're not, indeed, we said, how do you start a conversation of Rabbi Akiva by making it sound like it's in the middle? He came Rabbi Akiva and said, he says, because Rashi wants to emphasize we're not at the beginning of a conversation. This Rabbi Akiva is a continuation or is in the middle of what I've just said before that it's eaten by for two days and one night. So now Rabbi Akiva says, don't make the mistake to think that no, it's eaten just for one day. Like the Teida, no? The words L'cha tell us that this meat of the Bechor is going to be to you like the Shlomo. Okay. So it's a, a, a different reading. Once you read the Rashi that way, becomes everything becomes kafter everything becomes easy to read. However, we still left with the question: Why quote the name of Rabbi Akiva here? There's always whenever Rashi quotes the name of the author, it's telling us something a little bit beneath the surface. 
So paragraph six, after all this, a seasoned, a salty, um, a salty student, which means a very intelligent student would ask that the language of the Pusuk seems to be not totally glatic, not totally smooth. Why? The Pusuk seems to say twice the same thing. It says, uh, uh, the meat of the firstborn will be to you and then it says it will, like the shlamim it will be for you twice it will be for you so since the Pasuk repeats it twice it seems to say that it's talking about the same thing just to strengthen that same point like we see earlier in the shlach when it says that they sent 12 12 spies. It says, Ish echad, Ish echad lamata. One man, one man per tribe. It didn't mean to say they sent two groups of one man. They sent 24 people. It means one man, one man. Um, also, where it says, Nasi echad layayim, Nasi echad layayim, where the chiefs of the leaders of the tribes brought their sacrifices. It says one tribe and one Nasi per day, one nasi per day. Why is it, why the repetitive language? Because according to Pshat, according to Pshat, when you learn Pshat in, in Chumash, repeating it is poetic. It's the way people talk. However, the way we're learning the, the Pasuk, it's the first Lecha Yihyeh is telling us something general that the meat of the Bechar is in all ways like the Shlomim. The second L'chayiyah is telling us something unique, telling us that within the Shlomim family, the Bechar meat will have the time period of eating, not like the Teida part of the Shlomim family, but like the regular Shlomim. So it's not just the double expression here is not just being looked at as being repetitive poetically, it's looking at being specific. That's why Rashi emphasizes that this is Rabbi Akiva who says it, because there's an argument between Rabbi Akiva and the others. Rabbi Akiva says, does the, does the Torah speak the way people speak? People speak poetically sometimes. I go day, I go, I go by day, I go by day. It doesn't mean I two goings. It could just mean he's I shall surely go. Or it can be just a repetitive which gives power or strength or emphasis to what I've been saying. Rabbi Akiva says the Torah doesn't speak like people speak. If it says it twice, it's got to teach you something. So that's why we're quoting here Rabbi Akiva because here the Pasuk, the way Rashi is learning the Pasuk, the Lecha Yir, the second Lecha is not just being taken as a repetitive, it's being taken as, as an additive. It's telling you it's this meat is going to be eaten like the Shlomim, not like the Torah component of Shlomim. I, you'll ask Rashi, we just said, we just finished saying that Rashi usually doesn't explain Kefel. Rashi doesn't usually explain when the Pasuk repeats words because Rashi is of the general opinion for the five-year-old that the Torah speaks Kalishon Bnei Adam, the Torah speaks like people speak. And repeating doesn't, you don't need, you don't need to explain every time the Torah repeats something repetitive. That's the way people speak. So how is he now coming and speaking, saying that taking the opinion of Rabbi Akiva that no, if something's repeated, there must be a, a purpose. And by the way, um, Rabbi Akiva learns in the Pasuk, Ish Echad, Ish Echad Lamate. And when he said one man, one man per tribe, it was actually two men per tribe. The simple reading of the Pasuk, where Rashi, we learn in the Pasuk, is how many spies were there? Twelve. Ish Echad Lamate, one man per tribe. But the Torah says twice, one man per tribe, one man, Ish Echad, Ish Echad Lamate, one man, one man per tribe. Says Rabbi Akiva, the Torah doesn't just speak like people speak for emphasis. If it says one man, one man per tribe, that means two men per tribe. He was the opinion. There were 24 spies. But Rashi's not of that opinion. So how does he come now here and jump in Rabbi Akiva, who's got a who's differing with the way he usually interprets Chumash? But that's not a question. Because um there, when we we could explain why, even when we say that. That um, not like Rabbi Akiva, that the Torah says one man, one man. We understand that each person is so different that could be the Torah wants to emphasize one man, one man, and each one has his individuality. 
doesn't mean two men. Same thing when it says each Nasi brought, each leader of tribe brought their inaugural carbonus on a particular day. It also says Nasi Echad Le'yom, Nasi Echad It doesn't mean two per day. It means each of them was unique. However, here, the whole word is exactly the same. What would it be teaching you? So here I can use Rabbi Akiva's way of learning that it is teaching us something individualistic, but still Rashi brings Rabbi Akiva to show that this follows Rabbi Akiva's way of, 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 of understanding the Torah, that if it's a repetitive, it's teaching us something. Okay, if you didn't understand all of the details till now, that's Nishke Ferlach because... Um, so it's a bit of a technical, you have to really pull out the Rashi and see how to punctuate it and see where to put in the, the dots. When you do, if you would jump into this with the Rashi open in front of you and see what the Rebbe did with this Rashi, you'll see it's, it's incredible. I don't know if anybody ever learned the Rashi that way, but it's so clear. It's, it's uh, Clearly, Rashi is saying that in his opinion, the Bechar is like the Shlami meat in both things. It's eaten by the dependents and it's eaten for two days. Now let's go into the deeper esoteric. From the wine of Torah. Oh, you see, we brought wine. Soon we'll say the time. From the wine of Torah in the Rashi. Let's see like this. And here we're going to have a journey into the way the Rebbe emphasizes the way Torah looks at a fellow Jew. Mamish incredible. In the Sifri and the Gemara, there's another, there's another thought about what the Torah has to um, Bavorin, what the Torah has to forewarn that we shouldn't misrepresent the pus. What? How could we misrepresent the law of the meat of the firstborn? The Torah in the Gemara says, "Don't think that you should compare the meat of the firstborn to the meat of the sin offering and guilt offering." Because, I mean, why would you compare it? Because all three things are a gift to the kohen, also in a guilt offering and in a sin offering. There's parts that go to the Kayan. So you may think that just like in the Chatos and Asham, guilt and sin offering, there's parts of meat that go to the Kayan. And in the firstborn, we say the meat should go to the Kayan. Maybe they're the same. Maybe they should be governed by the same criteria. And therefore, we would say just like a guilt offering and a Chatos, a sin offering, is eaten only for day and the subsequent night, maybe also the Bechor should be eaten by day and night. Not just should we compare it to Taida, maybe we should even compare it, the Gemara says, maybe we should compare it to the other more generic kinds of carbon. These are very standard carbon, the sin offering. Somebody made a mistake and, and, and did something he shouldn't have done. He has to bring the chatos. The plenty of chatos is being brought up. Just, they were just standard stuff. So why, the Gemara says, maybe the the the, 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 the Bechor meat should be compared to the, should be governed by the same laws that the chatos meat that the Koyan eats is governed by one day. But Rashi doesn't bring that. Rashi just says, don't, the only forewarning Rashi brings is don't make a mistake and think that the meat of the firstborn should be governed by the same time restriction as the meat of the Thanksgiving, the title. Why? So simply speaking, the reason is because Rashi comments on the verse, on the words that say, like the waving of the of the meat of the shlami meat and like the right shank of the shlami meat and that is obviously not a guilt offering and a and a sin offering right because those carbonis um actually in the shlamim the kohen gets a limited part most of the meat goes to the owners the kohen just gets the breast and the right thigh so the Torah clearly says that the that the that the bechar meat is like, right? Like the portions that go to the koyim from the shlomim. You can't mistakenly think that that's the guilt and sin offering because there more of the meat goes to the koyim. Everything that's not brought on the mizbeach goes only to the koyim. Nothing goes to the owners. So we understand why in the pasuk Rashi doesn't have an issue. Rashi doesn't ask, "Shall I maybe say it will be like the guilt and sin offering?" No, because the Torah explicitly. Doesn't 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 compare it to that. However, we could say we could, however, say how. Oh, so why does the Sifri and the Gemara have to forewarn? Don't say it's like. Don't say it's like the guilt offering, because they're asking they're asking Mitzad Svara. 
they're asking logically. They're not looking at the pasuk. They're saying logically. If I know that there are certain uh, groups of meat that go to the kohen, like the guilt and sin offering, that can only be eaten by for one day and the night, and this firstborn meat is going to the kohen, maybe just like this goes to the kohen, but it has a time limit of one day. Maybe the firstborn meat also. Not looking at the pasuk that explicitly says something different, but thinking logically. That therefore, then he has to come and repel that logic. Rashi is commenting on the verse, so the that whole logical question doesn't start because the verse doesn't allow for that question. But now let's see allegorically remnants. Let's see what this tells us on a deeper level. In other words, is there ever a thought that the firstborn meat could be compared to a guilt and sin offering? In Rashi's opinion, no. In the Gemara's opinion, yes. This is going to be very symbolic because what is the firstborn represent? Who knows what the firstborn represents? The Jewish people. Because when Hashem wants to redeem the Jewish people from Egypt, what does he say? To Parai Beni Bechairi Yisrael. The Jewish people is my firstborn son. You touch my son, I touch your face. You know, they say in the streets of Brooklyn, you know, you don't mess. You don't mess with my kid. The Jewish people, they're my kids. And in the end, Hashem redeems us. So we're called the firstborn. The firstborn is an endearment. The firstborn is, is, is yeah. So when we talk about the firstborn, we'll come back, uh, Moshe. When we talk about the firstborn, B'chayr Adam, when we're talking about the firstborn in the, in, in the Jewish people, which has to be redeemed, so that we understand is the spirituality of the person. The the part of Hashem that's in us, that's the godly soul. But when we talk about that's that would be allegorically the Jewish firstborn that's born, and we do the process with the coin, we give him five coins, that would be like the Nefshal is the godly soul. Okay. The animal, the animal. When we talk about giving the first one of the animal, what would that be allegorically in us? Our animal. Remember, we, we have a nefesh abehamit. We have a, an animal soul within us, a, a, a soul that gravitates towards animalistic urges, eating and so on. And we also understand that there's three kinds of firstborn animals which are governed by these laws that it becomes a, given to Hashem and to the Kohen. It's a bull from the from the from the ox family, from the sheep family, and from the goat family. So when we're talking about nefesh abamit, about the animal soul, we know that Hasidus explains there's three kinds of animal souls, and there's some examples given. The ox, what is the ox known for? Goring, Goring. nagach, shor nagach. One of the things an ox can do in a in the rodeo in the in, in, in the thing, yeah, the bullfight, he gores. Some people have an animal soul that's a goring kind. Ah, it wants to attack other people. What's the animal soul? Like a sheep, what's one of the qualities of a sheep? A sheep seems to be indulgent all the time. It wants to keep on grazing. So you have some indulgent animal souls. They just want to keep gnashing. They want to keep indulging in life. What's the goat symbolic of? The goat is stubborn like a goat. Sometimes you have an animal soul which is stubborn. It doesn't want to move itself. Uh, for spirituality, for Hashem. So we can understand that there's three different kinds of animal souls amongst the Jewish people. So Rashi says, I don't have to say that the Bukhar, the Bukhar is the animal, the Jewish animal, the animal soul of the Jew. I don't have to say that it's not comparable to a guilt offering and a sin offering, a chatos and asham. Because when we're talking Pshote Shamika, the simple definition of a Jew, there's no even thought, there's no possibility that a Jew in his simplistic state will ever have any connection to sin. What? That sounds radical. A Jew has no connection to sin. So he says like this, the Zoyar says, when you're talking about the godly soul, the nefesh the kiss of a Jew, the, the Zohar says that the word in, in Bayikra that says nefesh ki techta, when a, when a soul sins, he has to bring a carbon sacrifice? The Zohar reads that question mark. Nefesh ki techta, tva, a soul that sins? How could that be? How could a godly soul sin? That's impossible. Even the lowest level of soul, which is nefesh, there's five levels, nefesh, even the lowest level of soul 
it's an amazing wonderment, an impossibility almost that we could talk about. It's sinning. How could it even fall into a sin? Now Rashi is telling us a bigger piece of news. That what? Even when we're talking about the Bechor Behemoth, not just the human, the, the godly soul, even the animal soul of a Jew, when in and of itself is not really able to sin. It's not in the realm of sin. More than that, even Besaram, we said that the meat, the flesh of the firstborn goes to the Kohenim, it also becomes holy. Even the flesh, the physical body is also, there's no thought to compare it to a guilt or sin offering. It stays free of sin. However, what is it like? The, 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 the flesh of the Jewish, in other words, the Jewish body, the animal soul of the Jew, is like the part you wave and the right thigh, the right shank of the of the shlamim. What is a shlamim? Shlamim refers to the fact that the godly soul of a Jew went down into an animal soul, to a physical body, in order to make shlamim, in order to make peace, not in order to sin, can't sin, but it, in order to generate peace in the world. That also this lower world should become a dwelling place for Hashem. You know, there's there, there can be friction in this world when the world doesn't want Hashem's presence to be there. Our mission is to create peace in the world and to synthesize, to bring together, to allow the spirituality, the godliness of Hashem to permeate and to be part of the world. So if you want to compare the basar, you want to compare the, the animal soul of the Jew to something not to guilt and, and sin, but even the animal soul of a Jew doesn't have a, a correlation to sin and guilt that I have to even negate. What it does have a correlation to is to shlamim, to the work of making peace here in this world between Hashem and the world. But we do have to negate something. What do we have to negate? Don't say, remember Rashi said, don't say that this meat of the Bechor is like a toida, is like the sacrifice you bring for a miracle. No, it's like a regular shlamim, the regular peace offering, which is two days, not like a teda, which is one day. Why would I have to negate, don't say it's like a teda? There must be something a little bit negative about this miracle offering. What's negative about the miracle offering? You know what's negative? On the one hand, the, the thanks offering, which comes for a miracle, is a shlamim offering. It's a peace offering. But the thing is that it only comes after there was first a a period of danger when a person was in a matzav in a situation of danger right and then he got saved in a unusual way something unusual happened a miraculous thing happened and that's why he's bringing a carbon tater remember you don't bring a a thanks offering when you know you were just mildly ill and you went to a doctor you got some antibiotics that that's it's also a miracle from Hashem but it's more natural when do we bring this kind of a thanks offering? When there was a possible danger, a real danger, and you needed something extraordinary, which doesn't always happen. God forbid somebody was an accident, and they could have easily, the accident could have brought other results, and he was saved in a miraculous way. Oh, that's a teda. What does that mean spiritually? It means that the person, we're talking about a person who's in a great state of danger, of temptation, and it's difficult for him to serve Hashem. And his, his spiritual life is in great danger. But he's been saved from this situation through a miracle. In other words, he may have dug deep into himself and jumped very high, did an extraordinary service to Hashem. Because don't forget, the things that you usually do, if you're usually serving Hashem in a particular way, even if it's high level, we say regularity becomes like nature. So when we're talking here about the person being saved through a miracle, in the parallel, what it means in serving Hashem, it means serving Hashem in an extraordinary way through Mesiras Nefesh, through sacrifice that's higher than logic. So now there's a, a thought to say like this, even though a Yid in and of himself, even his Nefesh Abamis, his animal soul, is not going to sin, is not connected to sin. So we don't have to say, why it's not compared to a guilt or sin offering. But however, to, to really life-threatening temptations and challenges, yes, and maybe the nefesh abamis, the animal soul of a Jew, is, uh, is a, a part of that kind of scenario. And the shlamim that it's, the peace that it makes in the world, 
has to do with some extraordinarily uh, um, sacrificial work that's almost miraculous. So Rashi says no. The Bechor, the standard service of the Yid, even from his animal soul to Hashem, the Pashtus, when we talk about a, a, a functional, simplistic, without complications state of a Jew the way he is, is that he has simple belief in Hashem, and therefore he's always together with Hashem, and in any situation that he is, there's not even any thought from the first place that he's going to make the mistake to think that he can rebel against Hashem and still be Jewish. He's going to stick to the path, to the straight and narrow path, without any deviations. And we don't have to say, we don't have to negate that he's not like a guilt or sin offering. No, what does a Jew have to do with sin? We do have to negate that he's that the standard uh, default of a Jew is like shlomim, like the peacemakers in the world, not like the ones that need to have the service to have miracles because they're always at peril in the world. So the fact that, because from the, if a Jew feels that he's at peril, that he's challenged to the point of, of God forbid, losing his spiritual life, it shows that something nit Yiddish, something not Jewish, so to speak, mixed into him. It's like there's a guilt or sin, something that's not really part of his genre. Because according to his nature, the nature of a Jew, by default, is not connected to negativity. He wouldn't sin. And therefore, from this comes out also in Gashmias. says that ever from this we can derive also in, phys in our physical lives that when a Yid acts the way he should, the way life should work, according to Hashem's plan, is he shouldn't need miracles to get by. In other words, there shouldn't be the need for a carbon teda for a Thanksgiving offering for being saved from a, from a life and death situation. It should be standard good. He should alpiteva. His nature should be that Hashem is with him. And if Hashem is with him, so Hashem protects him. Like it says in the verse in Tehillim, in 121, Hashem, Hashem guards you. Hashem, Hashem is like your shadow or your shade, protective shade on your right hand side. So if you're with Hashem, you don't need a toida even. The fact that somebody would need a Thanksgiving offering because he was in danger is already a sign that somehow he was in danger because the connection wasn't so, the internet connection was unstable or something. And now when we say when you're in Hashem's presence, when you're in the light of the melech, Chaim, that's where there's life. Hashem gives every aspect of life, bonnet, children, chaya, health, mezayna, parnosa, sustenance, wherewithal. And in all of them, revichi in an abundant way. That is the sicha for today.